everybody in here, you believe in God for something. There's something you're praying about. There's something you're knocking on the door. Hey, God, 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 hey, God. Will you, will you, will you, will you, can you, can you, can you, can you? All of those answers, all that harvest, all that breakthrough, all those miracles, it's out there in the deep. It's not in the shallows. It's not in the puddles. It's in the river. Now, that, that word deep is really important to me. That's one of the words that defines my life. Because when I was 13 years old, I had an encounter with the deep and my life was never the same. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, called into the ministry. From that moment forth in my life, I've always understood what was deep and what was shallow. And I've never wanted anything to do with shallow because I loved everything deep. Let me push all my chips to the middle. Uh, I want you to walk out of here today absolutely knowing 2024 is going to be your greatest year yet. Amen? Now that would be a, that's, that's kind of a lofty goal, but that would be pretty cool to walk out of this building just going, it's going to be our great, <laughs> right? And it's not some pipe dream, it's not hype, but you know it and you know how and you know why and you know who. Amen? And so that's, that's why I'm here this morning. Now listen, we're just, what, two weeks away from 2024? And uh, throughout the churches over these last few months, I have been getting the churches ready. I, I, I have felt a, a spirit of urgency on me. I felt a, a real strong prophetic flow to get the churches ready for 2024. Because two things can be true, dynamically opposed, that, that can be true at the same time. Number one, 2024 being an absolute mess. Chaos. Come on, chaos around the world. You ain't got to be a prophet to know that. You just have a little common sense. You don't even have to watch CNN Fox. Come on, now you just have a little common sense. It, you know, there's stuff, you, you, got, you got Israel, you got Ukraine, you got, you got stuff going on. It's, it's a political year. One of the devil's oldest go-to moves is to stir up strife and chaos in a nation during an election year. He's been doing it for forever. It's what he does. I've been in enough nations, I know. All right, and so he's going. He 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 did it before. He's going to do it again. You got economy. You got politics. You got the debates. You got division. You got all all the stuff. All the stuff. It's going to be a mess. I, I've been hearing this. Uh, we're either going to be focused on kingdom business or we're going to be distracted by the devil's business. And the devil's going to be open for business in 2024. Now all that can be true, but at the same time, you know what else can be true? It's our greatest year yet. It's our greatest year spiritually, physically, financially, family, yet. It's, it's our greatest kingdom building year yet. Amen? Yeah. In other words, where sin abounds, and there's going to be some abounding sin in this world, grace much more abounds. Now you've got a decision to make. Do you want to be on the sin side or the grace side? There you go. We're going to be on the grace side. We're going to be on the grace side. And you get to a point in your spirit, you get a, to a point in your heart, in your revelation, that no matter what the devil throws your way, you're going to see God overwhelm it. Come on, any resistance of the devil, God just overwhelms it. Come on, just anything, any weapon formed against you, God just overwhelms it. Come on, anything the devil tries to do to stop the momentum of Church of the Living God, God just ah, overwhelms it. Because here's why. Our Jesus is overwhelming. Let me say that again. Our Jesus, he is overwhelming. Jesus is, Jesus is not ordinary. He's extraordinary. Jesus is not natural. He's supernatural. Jesus is not enough. He's more than enough. I told him this morning, quit, quit praying enough prayers. God doesn't do enough. He's El Shaddai. He's the God of more than enough. He, doesn't, he wants you blessed to be a blessing. See, that's not enough. That's more than enough. So I'm going to make up a word. Jesus is not whelming. <laughs> Come on, help me. What is he? He's overwhelming. He, he's never done anything whelming. 
He gave us more earth than we need, more universe than we need, more stars than we need, more ocean than we need, more oil and gas than we need. He gave us more climate than we need. Come on, he is, he is whelming. He is not whelming. He's never done anything whelming. He's, he doesn't do enough. He's the God of more than enough. Old Testament, New Testament. Did he give them just enough manna to eat? No. He, he overwhelmed them with manna. Matter of fact, he told them, now listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. You ain't going to be able to eat all the manna I put on the ground. So don't bring it in your tent because it'll start stinking and you'll wish you didn't. So just leave it out on the ground and in the morning, that'll be gone and a fresh batch will be out there. Is that what happened? Because he's El Shaddai, the God of more than. Our Jesus is overwhelming. So let me, let me, and he wants to overwhelm you. Overwhelm you with what? How about his glory? How about souls? How about signs, miracles, and wonders? How about health? How about healing? How about peace? How about good sleep? Oh, how about everything you need to do, everything God's called you to do? Let me say that again. Let's slow that one down. He overwhelms you with everything you need to do everything He's called you to do. Our Jesus is overwhelming. And you've got to get that revelation in your heart. You've got to get that revelation in your heart. Turn over to Luke, the fifth chapter. Let me show you this in the Word. Ooh, I want this to just burn in your heart. Uh, Luke, Luke, the fifth chapter, verse 1. I'll uh, give you the, 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 the Philip paraphrase. Uh, early in the morning, fishing all night. He's standing by the, the lake of Gennesaret. He sees two ships standing by the lake. Uh, fishermen were out of them. They're washing their nets. They're ready to go home, go to bed. Mm. He enters into one of the ships with Peter. Hey, Peter, look, thrust out a little bit. I'm, I'm going to preach to the people. And he does. That was God's first microphone. Come on now. Water travels good over the water. He knew what he was doing. Verse 4, now when he, when he got done speaking, he said unto Simon Peter, now launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a drought. Simon, Simon always got something to say. Mouth of the south. Jesus, we've been fishing all night, bro. Ain't caught nothing. I was, I was born and raised on this water. Yeah, it, 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 the fish ain't out there. But okay, okay, okay. I'll cast the net. That's what you want. Anybody ever prayed one of those prayers? Anybody ever, God ever told you to do something and you're like telling God how it ain't going to work, but then you go, okay, I'll do it. Hey, do we all have a little Peter in us? Got a little, got a little, got a little, <laughs> I got a little Peter in me. Yeah, I got a mouth of, a mouth of the South myself. Master, we've told all night, have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down my net. Now watch what happens, verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets broke. Sounds to me like their nets just got overwhelmed. And they beckoned under their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, and the ships began to sink. Sounds to me like the ships just got overwhelmed. The nets got overwhelmed, the ships got overwhelmed, but something else got overwhelmed, their imagination. Come on, their minds were blown. They lived their whole life on that lake. They'd never seen anything like that. They lived their whole life on that lake. They'd never seen nothing like that. They've, they've been out there and caught nothing. They've been out there and caught 10 fish, 50 fish, 100 fish. They never caught so many fish that the nets were breaking and the ships were sinking. But once again, my Jesus is... He multiplied the fishes and the loaves. One time, uh, 12 baskets were left over. The other time, 7 baskets were left over. He doesn't do enough. He's a God of more than enough. Quit praying enough prayers and start praying more than enough prayers. He's not whelming. He's overwhelming. But here's the thing. Here's what you got to see. Where did he tell them to launch out into? The deep. He said launch out into the deep. Everything you're believing God, everybody in here. You believe in God for something. There's something you're praying about. There's something you're knocking on the door. Hey, God, 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 hey, God. Will you, will you, will you, will you, can you, can you, can you, can you? All of those answers, all that harvest, all that breakthrough, all those miracles, it's out there in the deep. It's not in the shallows. 
It's not in the puddle. It's in the river. Now that, that word deep, it's really important to me. That's one of the words that defines my life. Because when I was 13 years old, I had an encounter with the deep and my life was never the same. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, called into the ministry. From that moment forth in my life, I've always understood what was deep and what was shallow. And I've never wanted anything to do with shallow because I loved everything deep. And that's expanded over the time. So I could say it this way, I don't want to be a stinking parrot. I want to be an eagle. I don't want to be some pretty bird hanging, swinging in a cage, eating crackers. And the only thing I'm, I say is what my master has taught me to say. I don't want to be smoke. I want to be fire. I don't want to, I don't want to be the mission field. I want to be the missionary. I don't, I don't want to be an orphan. I want to be a son and daughter of the Most High God. I don't want to be a slave. I, I want to be a priest, a king. Come on, are you with me? I don't want to be a customer. I want to be a, a servant. I don't want to be a watcher. I want to be a worshiper. For me, life is simple. You either this or you that. You either shallow or you deep. And we got enough shallow believers. We need some deep ones. We got enough shallow churches. We need some deep ones. And everything you're believing God for is out there in the deep. And all you teenagers in here and all you young people out here, the world, oh, they're trying to get you to build your house in the shallow. And all your friends are shallow. And everywhere you go is shallow. But ain't nothing that you're looking for that's going to cause you to have this more than enough life is in the shallow. You're going to have to go. You got to go deep. And if God did it for me, God can do it for you. You got to go deep. But here's the deal, and I, I hadn't said this this morning. Deep is not just a place, it's a person. The Holy Ghost is the deep. He is the deep. It's not just a place, it's a person. The Holy Ghost is the deep. When Jesus said launch out in the deep, what did he say? Launch out into the Holy Ghost. He's your teacher, he's your guide. Come on, he's your paraclete. He shows you things to come. Oh, Holy Ghost, everything good in my life is because of him. And for us to think that we're going to do everything God's called us to do without Him? Ooh. If Jesus needed the Holy Ghost, how much more do we? He is the deep. Now that word deep, where does that word come from? Why is it so special to me? You know, when I read a book, I always like to know who wrote it. You know, I'll, I'll get a book and I'll, somebody give me a book. No, okay, I think I'm going to read this. But before I do, I need to find out who you is. I want to read something about that author. Because I do better if I have an emotional connection. You know, kind of understand a little bit. So uh, Psalms 42.7 says, Deep calleth unto deep. There's that word. Deep's calling unto deep. Are you hearing it? Every day of your life, deep's calling unto deep. Some days we hear it, sometimes we don't. Deep's calling unto deep. I don't want to be shallow, I want to be deep. Who wrote that? A lot of people think it's David, because David wrote most of the Psalms. But uh, David didn't write Psalms 42. At the top, it says the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah. Now I want to share something with you. Out of all the things I've preached in my life, 30 years of ministry, 20 years of 50 churches a year, it's probably one of the most beautiful, just beautiful, amazing stories that's just been such a privilege to, to tell. And it starts off not looking very beautiful, but it turns out beautiful. Um, who are the sons of Korah? Well, in number 16, there's this story of um, the family of Korah. And, 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 okay, set the scene. Wilderness, tabernacle, Moses, Aaron, priests, Levites, the, you know, the 12 tribes out there, 40, 40 years out in the desert. Okay, that, that, that's the setting. And... Um, you know, the tabernacle would have to be moved when the pillar of fire would move. Well, there was these three families uh, led by the Korah family, and they were the janitors. They were the custodians. They, had, they were the ones that would pack everything up and, and move it to where the fire, the pillar was. They, so they, 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 they did all the grunt work. They did all the grunt work. And, and, you know, and Aaron and his sons and Moses, you know, they were the priests. And, and you know, they, they, they kind of had the glamour jobs, you know. And then Korah and these other two families, they did all the grunt work, the hard work. Come on, they're in the trenches. And they got tired of it. 
Enough is enough. I, we, we, want a, we want a promotion. And they rebelled. Korah's rebellion. They rebelled. And they went and confronted God, confronted Moses, confronted the priests, and they're like, this ain't going to happen anymore, and we're rebelling, and we're gonna, we don't want to do this, and we're going to do that, and you better let us do what we want to do, or there's going to be trouble right here in River City. And so, you know, you got a gunfight at the OK Corral. You know, everybody shows up, and, and um, Moses speaks his piece, and Korah and, and that family, but they brought back up. Power move. They brought 250 dudes of great renown with them. 250 guys, brass scepters, three families, 250 men, power move. Come on, they're going to they're they're gang up. You better give us what we want or there's going to be trouble. Y'all with me? Smart move in the natural, huh? So everybody spoke their peace and it was time for God to speak his peace. Well, God had something to say, but it was nonverbal. Um, the earth opened up underneath those three families and swallowed them up. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, the earth closed up over them. Ooh. And then fire came down out of heaven and turned 250 men of renown into 250 piles of ash. Now, Brother Philip, I'm not getting the beautiful part. <laughs> That's horrible. <laughs> the sons of Korah were standing nearby. Why? I don't know. But they're standing there. What do you think it does for, to three boys to see their family swallowed by the earth? To see your family personally, come on, get swallowed by the earth and for the earth to close up over them. And 250 men who they probably knew a lot of those men die. What would, what would that kind of trauma do to three sons? Trauma. Everybody in here knows some sort of trauma. You've been through stuff this last year. You've been through stuff since COVID. You've been through a lot of stuff. There's some people in here that know something about trauma. You ever had the earth open up under your mom and dad and swallow them whole? Those boys knew trauma. What would, what would happen to most people that that would happen to? They, 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 I tell you what would happen. Most people, they'd hate God. They'd hate that tabernacle. They'd hate Moses. They would hate everything about the priesthood. They would hate every, come on, they would hate it all. They would hate everything that, 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 that God stood for, everything that tabernacle stood for. They would be bitter. They would be angry. Huh? And, and no matter where they went in life, if you squeezed them, what would come out? Hurt, pain, anger. Spend the rest of their life licking their wounds. And then what happens with trauma like that with anger, with, 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 with bitterness, all that stuff, is that stuff gets passed down from generation to generation. They did an experiment where they took all these fleas and they put it in a glass and put a top over it. Now, a flea can jump three to four feet. But they put it in a little glass, put a top over it, and the fleas are jumping, pop, 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 and they're popping the top of that lid. Pop, 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 pop. And finally, after a while, they, you know, they, they're, they're, they're not jumping anymore. And they took the top off, and the fleas couldn't jump out of the top of the jar. They were capable of jumping three or four feet. Now they can't jump three or four inches. That's not the sad part. The fleas have children, and they can't jump out of the jar either. Trauma. That's not what happened. Those boys, here comes the beautiful part. They didn't run from God, they ran to God. They didn't run from the tabernacle, they ran to the tabernacle. They didn't run from what God had called them to do, they ran to what God called them to do. They, they ran away from hate and bitterness and they ran to love and grace and mercy. And those sons of Korah, they, they filled in and they became the janitors. They became the custodians. They became the doorkeepers. They became the orchestra. And that family, that those, the core of family, generation after generation, filled that place in the tabernacle. Seven generations would go by and, and, and a prophet would arise out of the sons of Korah and his name was Samuel. And some of those uh, boys from the sons of Korah, some of that legacy would, were, were some of David's mighty men and they fought with David. 
There's your beautiful part. And thousands of years later, the people of Israel still celebrate the sons of Korah. Now, out of the book of Psalms, they wrote 11 of those Psalms. And the, and the one they, they wrote that's my favorite is Psalms 42. They wrote, deep calleth unto deep. And if there was any family in the history of the world that would have had the right to live in the shallows, live in the puddle, all their life bitter, angry. Listen, trauma anchors you to the puddle. It anchors you to the shallow. And you'll spend the rest of your life licking your wounds. But they got free. And they wrote, deep calleth unto deep. And they wrote that song, and listen, we're minutes away. We're going, to, uh, we're going to gather up here at the altar before we leave and sing this song together. And y'all, I think probably most of you know it. As the deer panteth for the water. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul. And many of you know that song. Sons of Korah wrote that song. That song's going to mean more to you. We got any sons and daughters of Korah in here? I want 2024 to be your greatest year yet. I want it to be your greatest kingdom building year yet. But three things have got to happen. You got three choices to make. Number one, we got to get all this trauma under the blood. And I know Pastor Trey, yeah, Pastor Trey's been preaching along these lines. He, he preached a message on this. You need to go back and, and get that message and listen to it. We got to get this trauma under the blood of Jesus. We got to get these wounds turned into scars. And one of the ways we do that is, one of the ways we do that is, it, it all hinges on one scripture, John 10 10. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come, so you might have life, or how about this, life overwhelming. See, why is that important? Because as long as you think God had something to do with your trauma, God was behind your trauma, God allowed your trauma, God permitted your trauma, God did that, God did that, you'll never be free from that trauma as long as you think God was behind it. But see, that's religion right there, religion. Well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. Well, I think my opinion, I don't, uh, what does the word say? Satan comes to steal, kill, and every one of you in here has lost a friend because they were blaming you for something that wasn't your fault. Raise your hand if somebody's ever blamed you for something that wasn't your fault. Now you know how God feels. You know how much stuff around the world he gets blamed for is not his fault? Everybody thinks he did it and the devil's over here laughing, going, <laughs> I did that and they're blaming him. Yes. All they got to do is read the word. Yeah, but Brother Philip, I know somebody and they would this happened and that happened and this happened and they came out of that thing and now they're ministering the gospel. They love God all the Yeah, yeah, that stuff happens all the time. It's called what Satan means for evil. God turns it for the good. It's what, what, what Satan meant for your destruction, God turned it into something for his glory. Come on. We got to get this trauma under the blood. Number two, we got to go deep. You got, it's a decision. It ain't a feeling. You got to make a choice that my life is going to be defined by the deep, not by the shallow. Now, there's a lot of things I could say about that. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, we could talk about getting in the Word more and worshiping more and praying more and fasting more and all the things we tell ourselves that we need to do. And, you know, January 1's coming up and, you know, we need to... You know, you read the Bible in a year and then we do it for about two weeks and then we don't and then we get to catch up and then we start feeling bad. I mean, come on. Everybody's been there, done that. You know, and all those things are wonderful. But I'm, I want to give you something so simple that all those other things will be a byproduct. It's a simple little prayer. You don't have to write it down. You'll remember it for the rest of your life. I've been praying it since I was 13 years old. Father, I want to be who you've called me to be. I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to go where you've called me to go. I want to give what you've called me to give. That prayer is supernatural. 
you start praying that prayer, and the Holy Ghost will begin to move in your life. Angels will begin to work in your life. Oh, Jesus will begin to deposit some things in you. God, oh, the Holy Ghost will begin to move you and position you. Oh, and show you things to come. Mm, and guide you and teach you. And mm, Father, I want to be who you've called me to be. I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to go where you've called me to go. Just pray that prayer. Oh, if you're young people, pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Put it on your mirror. Put it in your car. Put it on your phone. Pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Let that be your, let that be your war cry moving forward. And watch supernatural things begin to happen in your life. Ultimately, what that is is lordship. Can you imagine how many... Think about all the churches in Galveston right now. All the people that are in those churches. And how, what percentage of people that are in all the churches of Galveston know Jesus as their Savior. They're born again. If they died, they would bust heaven wide open, but they're not living lordship. They're saved. And praise God for that. They're going to get to spend eternity together with us. I mean, I'm glad. But they're not living lordship. They're doing what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, and who they want to do it with. They got Jesus riding in the car when he should be. Deep is lordship. It's giving him the, come on, Carrie Underwood, come on now. That's lordship. And then number three is uh, this word right here, this word, you can't have my word. <laughs> Sorry. That's my word. You can't have my word. It's got to become your word. You can't, you can't live Brother Philip's word. It's got to become your word. So today you have an opportunity to reach out with your faith and receive that word and do what four-year-old kids do when somebody grabs their toy and they yell out that four-letter word that begins with M. Come on, what's that word? Mine! But you know what most Christians have? They have those T-Rex arms. <laughs> Jesus is overwhelming. <laughs> Jesus is more than enough. <laughs> and you got faith to reach out and grab enough, but you ain't got the faith to reach out and grab You got to fully extend your faith. And this is how you'll know you've done it. You walk out of here today and you don't remember me. You don't remember my name. Which would make me very happy. All you remember is what you reached out with your faith. Your faith. With those King Kong arms. And grabbed hold of it. It's got to be mine. It's got to be yours. And if you can, if you can make those three decisions today, you're walking out of here today, you don't hope 2024 is going to be your greatest year yet. You know it. Come on, stand to your feet. Now listen, I, I know this place is packed. First service, packed. Every Wednesday night, Packed. What's happening here on the island is special. I hope y'all never take it for granted. I'm telling you, 50 churches a year and what's happening here isn't happening in too many other places. And y'all have got pastors who want who to get all the praise, glory, and the honor. And so I know the place is packed, but here, here in just a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to flood the altar. And it ain't about some get, it's not about getting in a line or somebody laying hands on you. We're just going to huddle up. And we're going to sing as the deer. It's going to mean more to you than it ever has because now you know who wrote it. And I want, you to, I want you to sing those words with every fiber of your being. Every fiber of your being. I heard told the story this morning. This uh, this kid, his, his folks were uh, killed in a car accident. I'll, I'll tell you the story. You got you, you stay. So these kids got died in a car accident. His kids destroyed the trauma, and you know, won't talk to anybody. And so his um, his uncle comes to see him, who's a chef. 
And so he won't talk to him. And so he tells the boy, he says, come, come on in the kitchen. And he goes in the kitchen and he turns on three fires and he puts three pots and he fills up all three pots with water and he brings it to a boil. Then he goes in the refrigerator and he grabs some potatoes, some eggs, and some coffee beans. Puts the eggs in one, potatoes in one, coffee beans in the other. Kid's sitting there looking at him like he's an idiot. You know, stupidest, stupidest thing I've ever seen. You know, rolling his... And after a while, he pulls the potatoes out, he pulls the eggs out, and he pulls the coffee beans out. And he, he says, young man, you got a decision to make. He said, are you going to be like these potatoes? Then potatoes go in hard. And they come out mush. Just psh, destroyed mush. He said, are you going to be like the eggs? The eggs go in soft, fragile. And they come out hard. It's what happens to a lot of people. They go into tragedy. They go into trauma. And they either become mushy potatoes, hard-boiled eggs. Then, they notice the coffee beans and they're unchanged. But not only are the coffee beans unchanged, but the coffee beans change the water. Coffee beans weren't changed. The coffee beans changed the water. Now that water, that trauma, that now it's fragrant and delicious. What do you want the rest of your life to be? You want to be uh, hard potatoes? Mushy potatoes? Hard eggs? Or do you want to be coffee? We got some sons and daughters of Cora in here. Got some coffee in here. I'm smelling coffee. Come on. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is simple because the anointing's so strong in here. It's going to be really easy for some decisions to be made because there's no yoke to hinder it. If you're here this morning, you say, Brother Philip, I got some trauma. I got some wounds. I need to be healed. I need to get that trauma under the blood. I'm tired of the wounds. I'm ready for some scars. I'm ready to get some trauma under the blood. If that's you, lift your hands all over this place. All over. I'm, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, come on. Come on. Got some trauma, and I need to get it all under the blood this morning. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. You put your hands down. Simple. Number two, Brother Philip, uh, I need to make a decision. I need to go deep. I don't want Jesus just to be my Savior. I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I, I, I want Jesus to lead, and I'll follow. I don't want to live in the puddle. I'm not going to live in the puddle. I want to go deep. I want Jesus not just to be my Savior. I want Him to be Lord of my life. If that's you all over this building, lift your hands. You want Jesus to be Lord. You want Jesus to be Lord. You're going deep, going deep, going deep. Hands going up everywhere. Awesome. All right. You put your hands down. Every head up, every eye open. You're walking out of here today with an overwhelming Jesus. 2024 is going to be your greatest year yet. 2024 is going to be your greatest kingdom building year yet. You're going out of here today not remembering me, but remembering the word that now belongs to who? Mine. Come on, if you want, if you want an overwhelming Jesus in your life, come on, lift your hands in this place. Woo! All right, let's don't mess around. Everybody gather up here at the altar. Come on. Come stand anywhere you want to stand. Don't get in a line. Just come on down. I know it's packed. Because the altar's packed, heaven to be packed. Brother Phil, why do I have to go down the altar? Because you don't want to. <laughs> the mere fact, you, we'll get you out of your comfort zone. Nothing supernatural ever happens in your comfort zone. Got a bunch of Zacchaeuses up here. What does that mean? Well, he climbed a tree and got out on a limb and Jesus went home with him. Let me tell you something. Rich, short, fat dudes don't climb trees. But he did. And Jesus went home with him. We're still talking about him 2,000 years later. 
We got some Zacchaeuses up in here? Yeah, you're at the altar. Close your eyes. Pray this prayer with me. Everybody say, Father, I love you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for me. All my sins, my regrets, my guilt, my rebellion, all my trauma, all the wounds washed away, healed, whole in the name of Jesus. Jesus, in this moment, I boldly declare, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. I'm going to be who you've called me to be. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. I'm going to go where you've called me to go. Jesus, you're Lord. You lead. I'll follow. Now lift your hands and let me pray over you. Father, in the authority of the name of Jesus, Father, I declare they're finishing the year strong. They're finishing the year going deep. They're finishing the year knowing 2024 is going to be their greatest year yet. 2024 is going to be their greatest year yet, spiritually, physically, financially, family. 2024 is going to be Trey and Marlowe's, Church of the Living Gods. Your, mine, greatest kingdom building year yet. In spite of anything the devil's doing. Economy, politics, war. Regardless of the sin, Father, this year, we're going to see your grace overwhelm that sin. And Father, we declare in this moment we're on the grace side. Now, Jesus, you're overwhelming, and we ask you to reveal yourself to us. Confirm this word in our life in the days and weeks ahead. Our eyes are open, our ears are open. Holy Spirit, do a work in our life. Show us, show us who we serve. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? We're going to sing that song. Everybody do this. Do this. Do this right here. You say, what am I doing? What, what am I doing? The, the, you have a scar. It don't hurt anymore. Your wounds are healed. It's a scar. It doesn't hurt anymore. Right? And listen, your scars are beautiful. My scars are beautiful. I love my scars. Your scars are your testimony. Your scars are your anointing. For the rest of your life, you get to show your scars and go, if God did that for me, God do that for you. What was the first thing Jesus showed the disciples after he was resurrected? Y'all ready to pant like the deer? Come on, lift your hands in this place. Hit it, brother. Ah. Come on. Panted for the water, so my soul long after.